What is up, up, Facebook friends? What's going on? I'm Max Lugavere, and I'm here with my very good friend, Emily Fletcher. That's me. What's up, girl? Hi, friends. How you doing? So happy that this is happening. Me too. I'm so happy. You guys need to know Emily Fletcher because she is one of the most sought-after meditation teachers uh, in the world. And I just had the pleasure of sitting through one of your intro courses. Because you guys might know, I talk a lot about the power of meditation to enhance your brain health. Um, but uh, I don't actually do it. Yeah, I, I talk the talk, but I don't. This is hilarious to me. Yeah, I don't. I don't walk the walk. Um, and a little backstory: I met Emily at uh, the Bulletproof Conference. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Amazing time. She gave uh, an amazing talk. Led group meditation for how many thousands, millions of people, millions, millions of people, or twelve hundred, or twelve hundred. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's an expert on meditation, so I just want to like do this little video with her. And feel free to like drop any questions for us. She's going to take some of your questions. I know you guys are all curious about meditation. I don't see any comments yet, but uh, I'm sure you guys are out there as usual. Um, so yeah, Emily, what would you say are some of the biggest misconceptions surrounding meditation? Mm -hmm. So there's one that's really big. I'm going to talk to these friends because otherwise I think it's weird. <laughs> okay. Um, do you want me to talk to you or Yeah, them? no, talk to them. Okay, hi friends. Um, so there's, there's a few big misconceptions around meditation. I think there's like one dude going around telling everybody that in order to be able to meditate, you have to clear your mind, like stop your mind from thinking. And I wish that I could find this guy and teach him how to meditate. Uh, because what I have found is that <laughs> the mind thinks involuntarily, just like the heart beats involuntarily. So trying to sit down and meditate and giving the mind a command to be silent is as effective as trying to give your heart a command to stop beating or your nails a command to stop growing. It doesn't work, you feel like you're failing, and then you quit. And none of us will do anything for very long that we feel like we're failing at. I would argue that the point of meditation is to get good at life. Right? And that has nothing to do with how many or few thoughts you're having in the sitting. It does, in my opinion, have to do with being able to access a, a verifiable fourth state of consciousness. So different than waking, sleeping, or dreaming, and in it you're getting very deep rest. And when you give your body this deep rest, it knows how to heal itself. And one of the things that it heals itself from is stress. Less stress in your body, you're able to perform at the top of your game. Why is stress so dangerous to the, to the brain and the body? Huh. Well... When we get stressed, the body starts preparing for basically like a predatory attack or like a saber-toothed tiger attack. So your brain and body start using all this energy to prepare for something that isn't actually happening. Hmm. Um, so it, it's basically taking your computing power. Also, your body floods with adrenaline and cortisol, which are acidic in nature. So it's not bad for you to get stressed. It's terrible for you to stay stressed because it's like dumping acid in your body all day, every day. And over time, that can lead to degenerative diseases. That can lead to erectile dysfunction, belly fat, balding, uh, a breakdown in skin elasticity, brain atrophy, um, obviously like anxiety and depression and insomnia and migraines. But, you know, so what do we do instead? We just meditate and then we flood the brain with dopamine and serotonin and make the body alkaline. Who doesn't want that? I that mean, sounds amazing. Nobody. I think it's really important to make the distinction between acute stress, physiological stress, like the kind of stress that you experience on the physiological, in the physiological sense when you have like a great workout, for example, and like chronic psychological stress, mm -hmm. which I'm reading an amazing book right now that you've probably read called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Mm -hmm. And it's all about how in the evolutionary sense, acute, drawn-out psychological stress, psychological stress is a relatively recent invention. I mean, if humans have it, a few primates have it, but really it's, it serves no purpose other than to, you know, get this really um, damaging chronic secretion of these hormones in your body that, as you mentioned, over the long term can atrophy the hippocampus, which is the memory center of the brain, the home of all of your memories. Hmm. It's crazy. Well, I would say that it actually does serve a purpose it, it, it serves the purpose of like outrunning that tiger or like lifting a car off the baby, that, that uh, um, original stress. But over time, the chronic stress is what's so toxic and dangerous to the body. And I think what's happening now is that it's become maladaptive. It's like the demands that we're under now, because they're not predatory attacks, um, but our body doesn't know the difference between like a bunch of emails and your mother-in-law or a saber-toothed tiger. Yeah. So it's, it's reacting to the stress in the same way. And now this fight or flight stress reaction has actually become maladaptive and is disallowing us from performing at the top of our game. That's crazy to think that like when you get stressed out because like that special someone isn't like texting you back when you <laughs> want them to, that the same physiological thing is happening as... What happened to our ancestors when uh -oh. a lion would start approaching? I ruined it. You know, no, it's okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, that, that sort of fight or flight activation of the sympathetic nervous system would kick in. We've got some questions. Not so I want to just, yeah, we've got a lot of Whoa, questions. Oh my Facebook God, this is amazing. Friends. 
Okay, so Gabriella asks, should you meditate every day and how long for? Mm -hmm. So yes, 100%, you got to meditate every day. Meditation is like any other tool. Like you could have the best trainer in the world and if you don't actually exercise, you're not going to get into better shape. Um, so I would say, yeah, you got to meditate every day. I personally recommend twice a day, but I'm kind of fond of saying these days that if you don't know how to meditate, then meditate for zero minutes because it's just going to feel like torture and... Um, not that fun. Um, the cool thing is there's lots of fun ways to learn to meditate these days. I mean, like Headspace has a great app. We have an online meditation training at zivamind.com. I think the best way to learn to meditate is face-to-face -face from a teacher, but all of us don't have access to that. So the cool thing is that we're living in a time where technology makes things much more accessible. But once you have a sustainable practice that you enjoy and that you feel like you know what you're doing, then absolutely every day. I do it before breakfast and then again before dinner, and I do it 20 minutes each time. Somebody's asking about their mother-in-law. <laughs> what about their mother-in-law? Is stress the antidote to the mother-in-law? Mm -hmm. Stress <laughs> is the antidote to all that crap. I mean, mother-in-laws aren't crap. I have one now. She's, um, <laughs> she's probably amazing. She is. Uh, do you have a book, Melissa wants to know? Oh, thank you for asking, Melissa. I actually just wrote a book called From Vodka to Veda, because um, <laughs> what I teach is called Vedic Meditation, and I paid my way through meditation teacher training, get this, by working in a vodka tasting freezer in Beverly Hills, mm -hmm. like you do. And I said to my boyfriend at the time, I was like, I think he's my husband now. I'm still with that same person. <laughs> but um, I said, I think I'm the only person on the planet that's like, waking up at dawn and meditating for six hours and then slinging vodka in a tasting freezer until two in the morning. My whole life is vodka to Veda, vodka to Veda. And so that was the birth of the book. And then I'm working on a new book now called either, and I'm taking votes, either Made to Matter or Selfish. Made to Matter or Selfish. What do you guys think? All caps self, little ish. The premise there being that most of us come to meditation for selfish reasons and then it ends up being the least selfish thing that we could do. Uh, so one question that I have, you know, I've always, um, when people historically have asked me whether or not I meditate, I always, my response is usually, you know, I play guitar and that's meditative for me, or I, I love to exercise, that's very meditative for me, or I, I go for a walk. Is that, am I meditating when I'm doing those things that I, you know, that I just cited? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have very strong feelings on this subject. Okay. <laughs> and I will, I will say that any act of creation any act of making music or some creative act, I think, is the closest thing that we get in our waking state to meditation. But here's my, here's my little two cent spiel on this. Um, is that when I tell people I'm a meditation teacher, a lot of times they say to me, oh, that's cool. You know, cooking is my meditation or exercise is my meditation or Facebook is my meditation. Uh, and the thing is, um, they're not the same thing. Uh, cooking is cooking. And exercise is exercise, and meditation is meditation. That's why they have their own words. What people are really saying is that that stuff uh, relaxes me, which is great, um, but it's not the same thing as meditation. I would define meditation as when you, yes, it's a stress relieving tool, but in the kind that I teach at Ziva, you're basically accessing a verifiable fourth state of consciousness. So it's different than waking, sleeping, or dreaming, and the right and left hemispheres of the brain start to function in unison, mm. and you also start flooding your brain with dopamine and serotonin. So it's not just like, oh, I'm going to think about my chakras, or I'm going to think about waterfalls. You're actually like, physiologically changing the, the chemical structure of all of the cells in your body. It's amazing. I mean, it's true. Meditation has been found recently to, to lengthen your telomeres, which are one of the very few biomarkers that we have for physiological aging, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. By the way, you're getting a lot of uh, responses that's selfish. People like the word, people like selfish. Oh, okay. Thanks, friends. Um, okay, so we got Ochoa, Ochoa, Ochoa. Asking, are there different types of meditations? Mm -hmm. Good question. So there's thousands of different types of meditation, especially right now as it's becoming so popular. Um, like I'm like the face of a new meditation app for Gaiam, and I'm like the face of this new thing, um, like a meditation for pregnancy program. So there's lots of different types of meditation, but most of them fall under one of two umbrellas. And this is a bit of a generalization, but I think for the purposes of this Facebook chat, it'll be just fine. Hmm. Um, hmm. Beth says, Emily, you rock, just so you know. Thank you, Beth. FYI. So do you. I appreciate it. Um, Joanna is asking if using meditation to help them fall asleep, is that uh, a, a good way to use, you know, is that a good, you know, utility for meditation? So it depends on what you're doing. There are guided visualizations that are, that are specifically designed to help you fall asleep. And I used to suffer from really bad insomnia. So I actually have something called Ziva Sleeps that you can get on iTunes or you can get it for free on SoundCloud. And it's just a guided visualization to help you fall asleep called Ziva Sleeps. 
Now, that's a guided visualization. And now, I would not recommend practicing meditation right before bed where you're accessing that restful fourth state of consciousness because it's the equivalent of about an hour and a half nap. So if you do that at 10 o'clock at night and then try to go to bed at 11, you're gonna have all these ideas and all this energy and no one to tell them to but your cat. So instead, we wanna meditate like mid-afternoon where we would have had that coffee or that nap or that chocolate. It'll give you like the second wind for the rest of your day. And then also, because it's get, it gets rid of the stresses in your body, that's why meditation cures something like 90% of insomnia. When I found meditation, it cured my insomnia on the first day. So I'm a big fan of meditation to help sleeping. Um, but I would not recommend meditating into sleep unless it's specifically a guided visualization for that. Is that why some people uh, often, as part of their routines, meditate first thing in the morning? Or is that just a function of like it being easy to build into your routine if you do it immediately I after waking up? I think both are correct. I think that it's best to do it before coffee, before breakfast, before computer, because when you eat food, your metabolic rate has to increase, your body temperature increases, and then that food gets turned into energy. So if you meditate right after eating, you're not gonna digest your food very effectively. You're also not gonna have a very fascinating meditation. So what do we do instead? We just wake up, brush our teeth, meditate um, and it's also if you get up at dawn I would say that's the most sacred holy time to meditate it's like waking I mean sun salutations Surya Namaskar that exists for a reason it's like you wake up and say hello to the sun and I, I believe that nature pays attention to those who are awake I love that Scott is asking a very important question he's saying would meditation be a step toward me cutting back on stress and anxiety medications that I'm currently taking you've taught thousands of people around the world do you have any case studies that you can report about people that have literally come off drugs? Hundreds. I wow. literally have hundreds of students who have, over time, working with me and their doctor, after many months of regular practice, yes, weaning off. I do not recommend stopping cold turkey. I do not recommend doing that by yourself. Um, but I do have hundreds of, of people who have gotten off. But here's what I recommend, is once you get a regular practice, you know, what I would say 20 minutes twice a day, you start training your brain to start producing its own dopamine and serotonin. After a while, you'll become a little less dependent on the pharmaceuticals for that in some cases. So what I like to do is work in tandem with their doctor and start to very slowly wean down the dosage and then wean down the frequency. And then usually that's, that's good enough for people to be self-sufficient, but that's a case by case basis and I'm not a doctor. Hmm. Owen asks, how do you feel about binaural beats and mm -hmm. other meditation technology? Yeah, so I'm a little mixed on it. I mean, I think it's cool. I think it's fun. I think there's a lot of cool, fun toys out there. You know, there's like the headbands and the binaural beats and the float tanks and the apps and all this stuff is great. And I love how excited people are about it. And I think that it's going to inspire a lot more people to meditate. But I'm personally a meditation snob. And I'm a purist, and the style of meditation that I teach is 6,000 years old, and I've been training to teach it for nine years, and I like went to India. And so in my personal opinion, all that stuff, all the binaural beats and the float tanks, and it's people are trying to externally induce what I get to experience every day, twice a day, simply by closing my eyes and using this technique. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, meditation apps that she recommends. Well, she has her own program. And by the way, guys, if you're just tuning in, I'm with Emily Fletcher. She's amazing. She's one of the most sought after meditation teachers out there. She's the founder yeah. of Ziva Meditation. Um, I just took their intro class. I'm super excited to learn how to meditate because yeah. I am a huge fan of the science behind meditation, but I don't actually meditate. So I came to Emily in hopes that she might, uh, you know, fix my broken, broken. <laughs> is not broken. No, no. I have to just it's give I have to give Max a, a quick shout out because I've seen your videos and I've seen you talk about the science of meditation and when you told me that you didn't have an everyday practice I was blown away because you articulated so beautifully you have such an incredible understanding for how the brain works. Thank you. And I'm so excited to teach you how to meditate because I, I think the world's going to catch on fire. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm going to report back to you guys okay. uh, about my journey. Um, Joshua is super excited. What's up, Joshua? Oh, Daniel somebody asked Bergen. about apps. Should I talk about apps? Yes. Apps. Okay, so um, there's an app that just released like two weeks ago. It's called Meditation Studio by Gaiam, and I'm one of the teachers on it. Um, it's guided visualizations, but there's all different traditions. There's Buddhist teachers, there's yoga teachers, there's me. I come from a Vedic tradition, and I actually used one the other night for sleep. It was lovely. Um, and then I have an online meditation training called zivamind.com, and that's eight days of video training, and it's a whole mature circulation and it walks you through step by step so that you have a sustainable practice that you can do on your own anywhere anytime and there's also guided visualizations inside of there 
We're, uh, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask one question. How long do people need to practice for before they become good at meditation? Like, like, how long does it take for them to start feeling the physiological impact of the practice? Well, it depends on the technique. It depends on the teacher. It depends on the person. But for me, at Ziva, with my students, most people on their first session are like, whoa, that was different. I was in a different state of consciousness than I've ever been. Wow. Now, within a few days, they start to notice, like, hey, my boss yelled at me, and I didn't yell back. Or, you know, I slept really well last night. Or I I'm literally hearing the birds chirping and seeing the sun shining or like my food tastes better or my sex is better my parking karma is better that stuff starts to happen within a couple of days wow that was great I just have to uh, mm -hmm. point out Katie just asked um, any studies on the effectiveness of meditation on Parkinson's I know you have a, a oh. beautiful story about that so I want to respond to Katie's question yeah thank you so much for asking so I've actually only taught one person who has Parkinson's but two of my team members now um, you know, used to work at a, at a foundation that works with Parkinson's. So here's the story. Um, this man, I did a private session with him. He was in his mid to late 60s, and he had pretty pronounced tremors. Um, and he was a little self-conscious about it, so I didn't really want to talk to him or ask him about it. But on the first day, you know, we did this beautiful ceremony, and I gave him his mantra, which P.S. is not like, I'm a strong, angry woman, or I want a million dollars. Um, the mantras that I use are meaningless, primordial sounds. So I gave him his mantra. He said it back to me and the tremors actually got much more pronounced. And then he closed his eyes and he started meditating and the tremors stopped like instantly. And I saw it and it, was, it felt miraculous to me. Like it, it felt like something I'd never seen before and I, I was very moved by it and I started crying. But again, I didn't want him to see that I was so moved by it. So I was kind of trying to keep it together. And then afterwards he opened his eyes and he said, did you notice that my tremors stopped? And I said, I did. And then about 10 minutes later, they started coming back. And then the next day we meditated together. And again, as soon as he started meditating, the tremoring stopped. And the next time, about 15 minutes later, they started back. The next day it took 20 minutes for the tremors to come back. So in my experience, meditation doesn't cure Parkinson's, but it will give you like a little bit longer reprieve each time. And it's not miraculous. It just turns out that dopamine, which is one of the bliss chemicals that your brain produces when you meditate, is a natural antidote to whatever it is that causes Parkinson's. I don't know enough about it to speak super intelligently. Yeah, par so Parkinson's is, um, it's, it's essentially what happens is a death of the dopamine producing neurons in a very specific yeah. part of the brain. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, as you know, involved in reward. That's why she referred to it as, the, as a bliss uh, compound in the brain, which is definitely true. But in Parkinson's patients, it's involved in movement. So theoretically, the idea that you can provide more dopamine to the brain would show a uh, a reduction in symptoms. I mean, that's actually what the gold standard drug for Parkinson's is. It's supplemental dopamine. Oh. And so it's very... So they do like 5-HTP and stuff for Parkinson's or no? 5-HTP is a precursor to serotonin, oh, which I is believe. Different. But, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but dopamine, it's actually interesting. When people take um, high doses of dopamine, they tend to exhibit riskier behavior, which is weird. You've got all these like Parkinson's patients running around gambling and having crazy set. I don't know. <laughs> That's awesome. That, no, there is a there is a risk of that. It's insane. But mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think that the the benefits to, of meditation to neurodegenerative disease can't be ignored. I mean, I think it's just like all signs are pointing in the direction that it's one of the best things that you can do for your brain. Um, all right, we got time for one more question, and it's going to come from Joseph, who asks, "Does meditation help with ADD?" Mm -hmm. So ADD, ADHD, PTSD, all this stuff, we, we, in India, we just kind of call all those things stress. And it's not to be pejorative or dismissive. Um, it's just that in, in India, when you, when, in most systems of natural healing, you got to go for the very root cause of those things. And in a lot of cases, the root is stress. So I'll do a little quick exercise with you guys. Um, think about any ailment that you might have right now. Like any ailment. Like I've skinned my knee or my boyfriend broke up with me or I can't find a job. Like any ailment. And now ask yourself, does stress make that worse or better? So my hypothesis is, unless you're currently lifting a car off a baby or outrunning a tiger, stress makes that thing worse. And ADD, I would say, is an ailment. And so the more stressed you are, the more those symptoms are going to be pronounced. And so when we get rid of the underlying um, imbalance, which a lot of times is stress, all of the symptoms start to dissipate. And I've, I mean, I've seen people like cure their IBS, migraines, insomnia, um, ADHD, ADD, PTSD, like, and it takes time. It's not magic. You know, it's like you want to get in better shape. You got to go to the gym every day. You want to heal your body. We got to meditate every day. Um, so, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but 
I think meditation makes everything better. That's awesome. <laughs> We're going to make a blanket dismissive statement. Well, it's just, it's so cool that like people have been practicing this for, you know, thousands, thousands and thousands of years. And now science with the, you know, the advent of certain scanning technologies have really, you know, it's opened this door for science to come in and look at the benefits that this is having on the brain that practitioners have known for eons, yep. you know. Um, it's an exciting time to be alive because neuroscience is catching up to what these Indian dudes have been saying for thousands of years. It's amazing. <laughs> Look at turmeric. I mean, turmeric is something that's been used in Indian cooking, Ayurvedic cooking for eons, and it's one of the best compounds that you can. It, it's like it makes our genome so happy to have turmeric mm -hmm. in our system, yeah. and science is now just starting to figure out why. So, Emily, thank you so much oh for my being gosh, here. My pleasure. What a delight. Also, can I show everyone my ring? I have my snacks ring. Can you, can you see that? It just says snacks. I like that. <laughs> I just felt like showing everyone. My Instagram bio says I'm big on snacking. I love oh, snacking. Yeah. of course we're friends. Hey. <laughs> we love snacks. You guys are amazing. Thank you, you so awesome. much for tuning in. You can follow Emily. You should follow Emily. Where can they find you? Uh, so I'm all over the internet just at Ziva Meditation. So we have a Facebook page, Ziva Meditation. We're on Instagram, Ziva Meditation. And our website is ZivaMeditation.com. Awesome. Don't forget to join my mailing list if you haven't already yes. at BreadheadMovie.com. And I will see you guys very soon. Peace. Thanks for tuning in.